Good morning, colleagues. Uh, Prof, could you kindly open the slide in presentation mode, please? Enable editing and in presentation mode. Thank you. Good morning, yeah. Hey, Baba. Good morning, Jonathan. How are you? I'm fine. That is our dearest Ibado. Yeah, Ibado is fine. Wonderful. Good to see you this morning. Thank you. Uh. Hola, hay que ir a la Colleagues, it's uh, 12 noon in East Africa, and I suggest that we begin keeping in mind that it's a busy time. I want to welcome you all to this uh, bright day when we have our first uh, live session for course design. Um, I want to welcome all our colleagues from across the continent, from Ghana, from Nigeria, from uh, South Africa, and back home here in East Africa. Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda. Most welcome to today's exciting session on course design. So we want to begin on a um, good note. We know Mama is in the house, so we feel very warm and taken care of. And so we want to start our session. And um, on the slide, you can see all those, uh, our colleagues that are working side by side us. Yes, move on. Yes, so this is the plan for our session. We shall have uh, this 10 minute introduction where we go over the deliverables and the learning outcomes. And then we shall have a presentation uh, by Prof. Hayemba for 15 minutes to digest and concretize the important principles and, and the practices in constructive alignment and others. And then we shall have a breakout uh, session where we shall have 10 groups and uh, we shall go and engage further with our colleagues after which we shall have a 10 minute break if we keep time and then uh, return for plenary, have some questions and we close. So that is our plan. We move on. Yes, so we always want to remind ourselves as educators to always remind ourselves about the training rollout and the deliverables to give us an overview of the course all the time we start so that we can position ourselves and see where we are coming from, where we are and where we are going. So at the beginning of this engagement, we had the pre-training uh, module where you got acquainted to the technology, to what the tools that you would need in uh, this training. You started off with uh, preparing some deliverables. You had to identify a course that you wanted to work with in this training, a course that you are working with in your university teaching, and you began to design uh, a template 
uh, for redesigning the course you are working with into on for online delivery. So you worked also on you started on your e-portfolio in that uh, pre-training. You created the e-portfolio, and I believe you're already populating it. So today we. We, we've been working on course design. You have been working on it asynchronously on the system. You've been engaging with materials on the discussion forums and journals. There's been very good engagement there. And so you have been learning asynchronously at your pace. So you also worked on a course design template. You filled out a template populated it on how you would want to design your course, to redesign it for online delivery. And I believe you have submitted your template for review. Perhaps some of you have already uh, got some feedback from the, the evaluators who have looked at your course design template. You also began designing a course on the learning management system, I hope, that some of us have worked on this and have created a course, maybe on Moodle, maybe on Canvas, maybe on Google Classroom. So those are the deliverables for that uh, course design. And here we are on the uh, live session. So when we go to facilitation, uh, can, you, can you go back, please? Yes, for, uh, first, for course facilitation, you'll be required to get uh, prepare a session plan. So there is also a template there. You'll be prepared to select from the course that you are redesigning. Something that you can teach in one, uh, maybe one week or one session. Since it is online, it could be delivered within, uh, within a week. So this could be like a topic or subtopic of the course that you are redesigning. But now you want to select something small, minute, and then you prepare a session plan for that, and you will also submit that. Then another very, very exciting thing that will happen in course facilitation is that you will have an opportunity to micro teach. That is, you will teach us. We shall become your students. And in our groups, in the breakout sessions, you will teach a component of that session plan just in about seven minutes. So you'll be trying out maybe a strategy of teaching, a technology that you will learn about, and we shall see you in action, actually teaching us. So we shall have two deliverables there. And then in innovative assessment, we shall see how then after you have delivered, uh, you have facilitated your course, how do you assess the course to ensure that the learning outcomes that you set out in your course design have been achieved. So the deliverables there is that you are required to submit a link to the e-portfolio that you began working on in the pre-training, but also you'll begin to prepare a, a rubric. You'll learn about all these things when we get to these uh, modules. So those are the deliverables that you'll have to uh, submit. And then finally, there will be that post-training where it's uh, not compulsory, but highly recommended, like we always say. Thank you. Can we move on? Yes. So that was an overview of where we are coming from, where we are going. So for this particular session, these are our learning outcomes. This is what we expect that by the end of these three hours, you will have achieved. We hope that you will be able to identify uh, appropriate multimedia, gender sensitive and inclusive teaching and learning materials to design or redesign your online course. Secondly, that you'll be able to utilize appropriate strategies for designing online courses that meet established quality standards, some of which you have already engaged with in the learning management system. And then that you'll be able to design a constructively aligned course outline for online delivery. And at the end of it all that you can incorporate peer and facilitator feedback that you'll get in the course of this uh, module for redesigning your course or module for online delivery. So those are the learning outcomes we hope will be achieved in this session. Thank you and back to you, Prof. Hayemba, to take us away. Thank you very much, Leah. Thank you for the introduction. 
And welcome colleagues from wherever you are to this our first uh, synchronous uh, session. So it's my privilege today to set you off by talking about uh, design, online design of uh, curriculum. Um, I begin by talking about the context of curriculum development uh, in this time uh, where we are 2021. Um, first, we have a lot of pressure from employers who demand specific competencies from graduates. They want to see people whom they recruit as if they are job ready. So somehow the expectation is that the school will be also a training field. And then there's also the accreditation bodies, higher education bodies that are responsible for um, accreditation of programs, who again insist on acquisition of employable skills. All that pressure is on the, on the university. And then society. The community, the parents expect learners to get employment upon graduation. There are very many parents who feel disappointed when their children are not able to secure employment. And somehow, although society is more than the school, but somehow the blame goes to the school. Then finally, learners who demand for employable skills, they want they, they want to learn what they think is marketable. Um, immediately they leave the university uh, corridors. So we are so we are in a situation where we have content versus knowledge. Now, in the past, we have had a lot of emphasis on content so that the lecturer saw himself as a dispenser of content. Some of my friends in Nigeria have called it the sage on the stage. But content is not actionable information. It's actually static. Then we aspire to pass over knowledge. Knowledge is actionable. Uh, it's defined as information that can be used to make decisions, to solve a problem, and to answer concerns. However, knowledge is not enough. For the longest time, we've all taught cognitive knowledge. We, we want uh, students to be able to, to learn. Uh, we, we even say, we even use words like to equip learners with. So we get stuck at content transmission. We get stuck at Trans, um, dictating notes. And at the end of the semester, if they can reproduce those notes back to you, that's the highest score. So we forget other aspects of, of learning, for example, the affective domain and the psychomotor domain. Now we're saying that these are equally important and they should find a place in our classrooms. We should also find a place for skills and attitudes. But we have to select, we have to select specific skills, we have to select attitudes that are important in, for society. Um, so we talk about key transferable skills because from school, it's expected that the learner goes to industry and employers want candidates who can think outside the box. So while they are with us, are we able to train them to think outside the box? That is what Pedal is interested in. So the cognitive domain has been concerned with basically recall. But now we want to expand what we teach to include employable skills. Many people have defined employability as a set of achievements, skills, understandings and personal attributes which make graduates more likely to gain employment and be successful in whatever they choose to do. So it's not just about recall, it's more that should be dispensed, should be facilitated for 
students in our care. So I use this slide just to go back to when people started thinking about different types of learning, just uh, uh, different from the cognitive aspect. So for example, 1974, Alexander and Yellon argue that there are four types of learning, 1974. But of course, it takes time for ideas to become popular and to become accepted. So they talked about concept learning. They talked about learning of principles, um, perceptual learning, and then problem solving. According to them, these were important types of learning which should be incorporated in the curriculum. Um, about 20 years later, or 25 years later, Knight and York suggest that in society, cognitive knowledge is not enough. So we should go beyond teaching, just recall memory. So in their view, there is need to expand learning to include, to include employable skills. And then they define um, um, employ, employability or employable skills as those things that we are likely to remember, we are likely to carry with us outside the corridors of the university. So we are now talking about 21st century skills. I, 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 I seem to see that this is now a concern everywhere in Africa, in Europe. People are talking about skills that are not necessarily pegged on a degree, but on what the learner can do. So most of the uh, adverts for advertisements for em employment are looking for what they are calling 21st century skills. And normally in those adverts, they list them. They talk about somebody who has leadership skills, somebody who is able to communicate, someone who is able to, who has uh, interpersonal skills and human relations, somebody who is, who is a creative thinker. They list those things the ability to do research and plan. So they list those things. And in fact, sometimes you notice that they are not interested in the degree the person got. They want that ability to deal with problems in the organization. So those skills, we now summarize them as the four C's for ease of memory. We summarize them as communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity. So this is uh, yes, a way of putting together what they are calling 21st century skills in a way that we can remember them and ensure that we are teaching them when we are teaching. Whether you are teaching chemistry or public policy, you want people who can communicate, who can work with others in a group, who make sense of out of data given, and who, when given a situation, they can use the information they have to create a solution. So we need to infuse knowledge, attitude, and skills in curriculum, in what we teach. We do this at a time when we are preparing the course outline. So, so colleagues, I, 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 I'm sure many of us had done that, have done that work. Uh, we submitted our, our, our efforts. Just by doing the work, I'm sure it was an opportunity uh, to, to learn. To learn, to ask yourself questions, introspection, reflection. So we are saying, are we able to put infuse knowledge, attitude, and skills in the curriculum? Now, so some things cannot be taught directly. For example, attitudes. But they can be taught indirectly. Although it's not just the teacher who has that responsibility, because sometimes the teacher teaches, and as soon as the learners go home and uh, set up their TV, they start seeing the opposite of what the teacher was teaching. But we want to be able to facilitate acquisition of knowledge. However, we should facilitate that in a way that leads to recall, long-term memory utilization. Then skills also. Each subject has some important skills. If it didn't have, it will not be on the curriculum. It will not be in a program. So each, whatever you are teaching, understand that it has 
life skills which are important. How do we infuse those into the way we teach? So now the new focus, um, the new focus then is on knowledge, skills, pedagogy, and assessment. So we want to facilitate individuals to generate different levels of knowledge. This is something I'm going to talk about twice or so more. There are different levels of knowledge. We want to facilitate learners to acquire lifelong skills when we are teaching a session, when we are teaching a course, when we are teaching a program. Remember, whatever we do in the session is building towards the requirements of the program. And for pedagogy, we believe that the way whether learning takes place or not depends on the pedagogical strategy adopted. So that Pedro will tell you about innovative strategies. Innovative strategies that create exceptional learning moments. The exceptional learning moments are those that they will not forget. So you can imagine if every lesson you are conducting is an exceptional, provides an exceptional learning moment. That means they will not forget what you are doing. And then finally, assessment. Assessment that goes beyond recall. Assessment that tries to seek to assess how people use the knowledge in authentic situations, real life situations. So allow me to use two minutes to talk about the online course design in context. We had face-to-face, -face, now we're talking about online because we've been forced in a situation where we must think about how to continue teaching even in the midst of a pandemic. So Pedro emphasizes a learner-centered, outcome-based approach to learning. In all that we're going to talk about up to the end of the third week, you'll realize that we are talking about the, the learner as the center. Because the teacher, the facilitator doesn't teach, doesn't learn, he teaches, he facilitates, but the end game should be the learner. We also talk about the outcome-based approach. There's an advantage out of this. So we emphasize the ability, the performance of the learner more than the teaching processes. So that we shall persuade you to understand that it's not all the time the teacher talks that the learning takes place. The teacher can also keep quiet and the learners talk and there is learning taking place. So we emphasize learning outcomes because then they represent an adjustment, a shift from teaching to learning. So the learning outcomes emphasize what should be learned. And once they have learned, what should they do to show that they have learned? Not so much what we may have taught. But we also use this because, as you'll see in another two slides, that they enable easy integration of academic and vocational skills. So, so if society is interested in people with hands-on, people who can do, then the outcomes approach enables us to prepare learners with the cognitive knowledge and skills to be able to operate in the modern world. So colleagues, you want to look at your selection of, of goals, where you begin from the university strategic plan, which are general, uh, you are not responsible for the strategic plan. It's usually handed to us, it's prepared every five years, but somehow the management of the universities create a certain direction that they want the university to, to go to. They have a vision, they have a mission. So we prepare academic programs to fit that vision and mission of the university. So we then come in at our level, we begin to develop academic program where we have objectives and outcomes which are general, which are long-term, 
which may be achieved in four years, the length of the program. So if it's a PhD, maybe three years. What should this person be by the time they get that PhD? And then more specifically now to yourself as a lecturer, you have your course, the course that you're teaching. So you have objectives and outcomes which are specific, but which are achievable in one semester. So when you're writing an outcome, the issue is, is it achievable within the semester? Because now you are not dealing with the academic program, which has got first year, second year, third year. Now you are dealing with your course, which is to be taught in a semester. Then down more specifically, you have the session, a session that you're going to teach. Maybe two hours, like Leah was saying, maybe a week because it's online, it may be longer. But you are talking about objectives and outcomes which are most specific and which should be achievable in one session. You should be, they should be achievable in the session that you are, you are preparing, are presenting. So that, that's just the same idea. Now, when we are designing our curriculum, we normally design backwards. So we start from the university expected learning outcomes captured in the mission and vision. Then move backwards up to the lesson that we teach. But when we come to deliver, we deliver forwards. So we start with the lesson that we are teaching and move forward to capture the mission and vision of our university. So let's now talk about what has been said about learning, what we have been um, um, struggling to, to do. So I want to talk about Benjamin Bloom's and others, taxonomy of education objectives, which laid out objectives for teaching at six levels. Uh, they had remember, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. That was in 1956. That was about 65 years ago. So after some time, Bloom himself had this to say, and is quoted by Anderson and Soniak. He said, teachers are so busy teaching that they, are often, they often get their information secondhand, secondhand in quotes. In this regard, Bloom said, the original handbook was, more, was one of the most widely cited yet least read books in American education. Bloom was an American. He's saying, in American education, the book, his book, was least read. Actually, it was it's a big thing. Now, talking about American education, I don't know what you would say about African education. So many of us may have quoted Bloom 1956, but maybe those of us who have read it are, are fewer than that. So his colleague called Crathwell and his student that lady uh, Anderson now revised the original Bloom's taxonomy and first published in 2001 and 2009. But they didn't do it on their own. They called many people, up to 400 curriculum specialists, scientists, to discuss, evaluate, and review the original Bloom's idea. But by the time Bloom went away, he had also be began to understand that um, his work of 1956 required review. So now, the colleague Crathwell and students revise it and change some things. So here, they introduce now verbs. So remember, understand, understand, you have to be careful with that, that one, apply, analyze, evaluate, and then they swap synthesis and put create at the top. So because now according to them, they're saying that create is the highest form of thinking more than evaluation. Uh, because here, evaluation had been considered the highest form of thinking. But now uh, the colleague and, and student are saying, evaluate, you are evaluating what somebody has done. So doing is the higher form of thinking. Now, today, 
the pedal curriculum um, course outline that we see is based on the theoretical framework of the revised Bloom's taxonomy. The revised Bloom's taxonomy presents cognitive processes and the types of knowledge. Now, these ones in, uh, 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 um, developed what they call types of knowledge so that we don't fall into the trap of just dealing with the, with the memory. They created a situation where we have to think about other types of knowledge. So that here, if you look at this suggestion, most of us, we tend to ask questions at the first two levels. Whatever, even if, whatever. Most of our questions end up there. Few, like mathematics, will go to application. And then some people, like in literature, will ask maybe a question in analysis. But they, most of the time, we want to see them recall. Anderson and others want to encourage learning, practice, and application of knowledge in real life. And I think that is the way it should be. Everybody is saying that, but no one has come up to say, can we use the revised Bloom's taxonomy as a framework to, to, to see how we can teach and how they can learn? There are four organizing questions that Anderson and others raised. So the four questions are the learning question. There are so many things to be taught and to be learned. So what is important for students to learn in the limited time available? We have to choose. Curriculum is always a matter of choice. Then the instruction question. How does one plan and deliver instruction that will result in the high levels of learning to large numbers of students? Some are slow, some are fast, but to the highest number, what can we do? That's what they call the instruction question. Then the assessment question, how does one select or design assessment instruments and procedures that provide accurate information about how well students are learning? In fact, that is the key question. But my friend um, Lester, um, uh, Betty, uh, and, and uh, Raphael will deal with that in the, in the last week. But assessment is important. What are you assessing? That's a question we don't usually ask ourselves. You are assessing, you've been told by the head of department to set exams, but okay, you're setting exams, but what are you assessing? That's a question I would like even if you forget everything else I'll say to colleagues, just remember that one question. What are you assessing? Then finally, the alignment question. How does one ensure that the objectives, instruction, and assessment are consistent with one another? So alignment, what we've now come to call constructive alignment, is what we want to use three, four minutes to talk about, and we'll be through. So. Constructive alignment is a principle made popular by John Biggs, which states that assessment tasks and learning out experiences must be linked to the learning outcomes of the unit of study. What are you assessing? So you must be assessing the attainment, the achievement of learning outcomes. If, if you are in Kenya, if you are a Kenyan, if you are at the University of Nairobi, you've been following the debate about CBC and homework uh, and so on. So the argument is, if you are giving homework, then that's a learning experience. That's a learning task. The learning task must be associated, must be related, must be helping to achieve the learning outcome. But if it is not in tandem, then there's a problem. That's what we are calling constructive alignment. The learning outcomes that we write ought to be specific, measurable, and actually attainable. 
So if we align assessment tasks to content and learning activities, then we ensure that learning is efficient. So the concepts are th three, um, two, constructive alignment. So constructive comes from the concept, the idea that learners construct knowledge from environment and learning activities. They make, they can create knowledge from what they see. They get meaning from what they create, from what they see, from what they do. And each one of us, each one of us sees meaning in different ways, perhaps depending on our training. Then alignment is what the teacher does to ensure that assessment tasks are aligned with the learning outcomes. The teaching tasks, the teaching experiences, the learning experiences, the assessment tasks must all be geared towards achieving the learning outcomes. So constructive alignment then is where learning outcomes, learn activities and assessment tasks are all aligned. That is important. So Big's model, he had those three pillars where we're talking about learning outcomes. What should they be able to do to show that they have learned? Then learning experiences, what should they be able to learn? How do they learn so that they attain the outcomes? If you want them to learn how to drive a car, how, what experiences do you give them? It must be about actually driving a car. And then assessment tasks are those that reflect the learning outcomes. So if the learning outcome is to be able to drive a car and the teaching learning experiences were about driving a car, then we expect that the assessment task should be about driving the car. That's what we're calling constructive alignment. But many times in our own teaching, we break assessment tasks from learning outcomes. We don't connect assessment tasks to teaching learning experiences. And therefore, our program then becomes unfriendly to the learners. So this model seems to put expected learning outcomes in the center. What do you want them to be able to do? So we have teaching and learning activities, which are designed to meet learning outcomes. We have assessment methods which are designed to assess learning outcomes. It should never be that we are assessing to catch those who are not attending classes. So that's constructive alignment. So now let me go to some components of the course outline that we develop for online learning. I'll just mention three. So, Objectives. Objectives have uh, been changing over time, the meaning of objectives. But after the out, out, um, um, outcome approach was introduced uh, through the Bologna process and so on, it is now used to refer to what the teacher, what the course intends students to learn. They describe what the student should be able, the, the, the target of, 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 of learning. And they say, teaching is an intentional and a reasoned act. So we have to know out of all these things that we have, what we want them to, to learn. So we select. We have to make a deliberate choice of content because there are so many things to teach and to learn but we cannot do everything, so we select. That's what we are referring to as reasoned, it's intentional, and it sets out to isolate those things that the learners should learn. So we set objectives to be able to give us factual knowledge, conceptual knowledge, practical knowledge, and metacognitive knowledge. What about learning outcomes? That's another important item in the course outline. 
So the learning item, uh, sorry, learning outcome is a written statement of what the successful student is expected to be able to do at the end of the course. Learning outcomes carry, on, carry an action verb and an object. Now, this coming from revised Bloom's taxonomy. So we should plan units so that we have expected learning outcomes which are precise, which can describe exactly what we want the learner to be able to do, exactly what should they be able to do, so that we don't say demonstrate the ability to, instead of saying demonstrate the ability to, we should just say what they should be able to do. Just say what should be, they should be able to do. So based on the revised Bloom's taxonomy, we now have the knowledge dimension. The first factual knowledge, conceptual knowledge, also called intellectual or reasoning level, procedural knowledge, also called professional or practical knowledge. So people will say factual knowledge is knowledge what? Conceptual knowledge is knowledge why? Procedural knowledge is knowledge how? And then all this knowledge is useless if we don't have values. What we carry to life and what we use in life comes under the metacognitive uh, level. But the fourth level is also about communication. It's about collaboration. It's about all those things that we mentioned as four Cs. Now, when one write an outcome, <coughs> we now combine a verb and a noun. So the verb from the cognitive process dimension refers to the intended cognitive process. But now it must be about something. What type of knowledge are we thinking about? Now, that is just a framework which compels us to think, do I just want to teach them to remember? So we have a noun which comes from the knowledge dimension and describes the knowledge types that students are expected to acquire or construct. Whatever, whatever course you teach, it has knowledge type of knowledge, knowledge of what it is, reasoning why, how, and the key transferable skill. So for example, I could say by the end of this session, the participant should be able to design an online course in public policy. So based on revised Bloom's taxonomy, we usually say we want to deal with the levels of thinking. So we want an outcome that deals with the low cognitive level, which we are saying remember and understand. Although we are saying low, but it's the basic, it's the most important. We must begin from the learners understanding what they, what's being taught. Then having acquired that, then are they able now to reason? So then we say, apply, analyze, evaluate, create. But some of those come down to practical and professional skills to construct, to design, teaching, modeling, and so on. And then the key transferable skills. So if you notice somebody is telling you four levels, the four levels are now uh, a way of structuring so that we don't concentrate only on one. Because when we are not careful, we end up like this. This is from a live course where outcomes have been stated. And in fact, this is a postgraduate course. <clears throat> so colleagues, you notice what I've put in, uh, what I've colored. The first one is described. The second one is described. When you go to Bloom's taxonomy, those verbs are low level, one and two. Just able to describe. So what you would be saying here, colleagues, is that you are teaching this postgraduate class in epidemiology 
to be able to describe epidemi epidemiology and historical evolution, to describe the epidemiologic methods, to describe different modes, to explain the steps, to describe. Then somebody will ask you, what about level three and four? What about the professional skills that this person has come to do masters for? The practical skills. Because I have not done epidemiology, but I'm sure I can describe ethical issues in epidemiology. You may not have done uh, um, uh, epidemiology, but you can do number five. So why are they doing a master's in numbers? Hello. OK, thank you. So why are they doing a master's? Well, let me try to deal with it. Yeah, please. Thank, thank you. I'll mute, I'll welcome, mute welcome everybody, Simon. then I'll allow you to unmute yourself. OK, welcome, Simon. Try it now. OK, thank you. Thank you, Simon. So, so, so if we're not careful, if, if we don't have this framework, then we end up with this. And, and we'll even see nothing wrong with it. But what you're doing is you're teaching somebody a master's in epidemiology. And when they go to the employer, wherever they're employed, wherever, the employer wants them to be able to do something else apart from describing determinants. This is another live course, just taken from our experiences at Pedal, where you want them to explain, describe, describe, explain, explain, describe, explain. So, so now, again, this is a postgraduate course. Why should somebody do a postgraduate course just to explain color vision? That is the challenge, and that's why Pedal wants to make us sensitize us just to think about the higher levels of thinking. Because when we structure it in a way that tells us there is level one, level two, level three, level four, then we are compelled to begin to think. Because the biggest part of teaching is the planning. The rest is easy. But the planning is what we need to plan, plan well so that they can learn, learn what is important. So here, colleagues, all I do is just to give examples of course objectives. Uh, first, there's a STEM. This course seeks to enable learning about. Now, although it's an objective, notice we are stressing on the learning, the learner learning. Then we have them as a role of uh, philosophy and research, characteristics of uh, development, and so on, so that you can see Number four, you can call it a key transferable skill that I learned to do it in class. But if I go to, to, to Ibadan University and my first task, I'm, I'm employed as an admin assistant, I can analyze, I can collect data and, and analyze. Outcomes, an example, again, we put the emphasis on the learner. And it sounds banal. It sounds banal to have to keep repeating the learner should be, but it is a way of making you conscious on whom you are writing this for. You are writing for those people who should learn. If, if you don't do that, and then you end up writing for yourself, but you're not the learner. So the outcomes, there is a STEM, and then it gives us the type of thinking, the level of thinking that we expect them to be able to do. So for example, number four, that they should be able to conduct effective data collection and, and analysis. So those are types of knowledge, <clears throat> factual, conceptual, procedural, metacognitive, which I've talked about. Finally, assessment. We, we, we said uh, outcomes, activities, and now uh, assessment. So, the curriculum will be prepared by whoever, yourself, a department. But for you, the expected learning outcomes come first. You want to cover the content. You want, you, you are focusing on the learning outcomes. You want them to learn. But for the learner, 
assessment comes last. They, they are not keen. In fact, as soon as you issue, even for PhD, as soon as you issue the course outline, the next question they ask you is, teacher, do you have past papers? F for them, that is the curriculum. So for you as a teacher, assessment comes last. Unfortunately, from my experience, sometimes the assessment is not based on learning outcomes. Unfortunately, from my experience, many times the lecturer will not have a course outline. <laughs> I noticed, I'm sorry to say this, colleagues, I also noticed that uh, four or five of us just submitted blank things. That's okay. Um, that's okay. But it tells you that you are not able to do a course outline. Not even the one you had before. Because all we were asking is, even the one you have, just put it there. And then we can talk about that. You, you, you transform what you had. But about four or five, four or five people submitted blank. So for the lecturer, the assessment should be on the outcomes. But for the learner, they want to learn what will be assessed. So how do we deal with this now? As much as possible, we should reflect curriculum in assessment. So you have objectives from your perspective as a teacher. You have objectives, you have expected learning outcomes, then you have teaching activities, and finally, you want to bring in assessment. But what do the students want? The students begin with assessment, then learning activities, and then outcomes. It's just one of those things that... So, as much as possible, we want to reflect in the assessment, the activities of the teacher, the learning, so that we are focused on the outcomes. If we, we, we do that, then it means we are on the same page with the learners. So, so colleagues, I, I want to stop there and invite Simon uh, to proceed with the next section. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Professor Hayamba Ongeti for that uh, very uh, insightful uh, presentation. Now, um, I will, uh, Prof, maybe the next slide, or maybe I'll, I'll share mine, don't worry. I'll just share my slide and um, um, let you know what we're going to do next. So we're now moving into groups. We are going to be in groups of around, uh, well, right now we're around groups of around 10 to between nine and 10 uh, participants. Now you're going into the groups and um, these groups are going to run for 50 minutes. They're going to run for 50 minutes. Um, two things, uh, three things that you need to know, one, you're going to be auto automatically moved to rooms, to breakout rooms. When you go there, it's important you know which room you're in. Why is this important? Because if you drop off, maybe your connection is not that great and you drop off from the, from the room, you will need to go back to join back that room. And you need to know which room you're going to join. So when you come back, if you drop off, you go to breakout rooms, it will appear at the bottom. Right now you can't see it, but it will appear at the bottom. If you're using a phone, you also see it, breakout, uh, breakout rooms. If you don't see it at all, you go to more, you should be able to see it, breakout rooms. Then when you go to breakout rooms, you select your room and click join. So I repeat, you go to breakout rooms, you choose your room. The rooms are named one, two, three, four, five, up to 10. You select your room number, and then click join. So what you're going to do in the groups, uh, we are going to consider two questions. The first question is, um, is, is particular to the group. That means um, it's different. One group is different. One group's question is different from the next. 
And then the second question is common to all groups. The second question reads, using the screen sharing feature, display the course you designed or redesigned on the learning management system. Briefly share what your aha moment was during the period you were designing or redesigning your course. So if you did some design, as Leia had said before, if you did something on the learning management system, Sakai, Moodle, whatever, Blackboard, whichever learning management system, Google Classroom, you can, you can display. It may not be something big, it may just be something small. Or if you have something that is very interesting that you are already doing in your university that you would like to share, even if you didn't do it right now, you can do that. Alternatively, if you don't do it, you don't, if you don't have any at all, you can also share the course outline that you developed, the one that uh, Prof has just been talking about. So you can share it as well and talk to it. So there are two ways you can approach the second question within the groups. Now, each group will have um, a note taker who is going to present back to the plenary. Now, it's important that this note taker makes uh, critical points for question one and then just gives highlights of question two. They're just aha moments. You're not going to narrate this person came and presented, this is what the issues that came up. No, they're just aha moments. For example, um, uh, it was interesting for a group to learn that... Uh, uh, there's a big difference between objectives and learning outcomes because most people have been using them the same way, using them interchangeably, you know, something like that, aha moments. Um, now, I'll not read through, okay, maybe let me just read through the questions very quickly. Uh, so quest, uh, group one, you'll have Esther, uh, uh, Professor Babalola and Patricia. In that group, you will be asking the question to what extent does the outcome, of, outcome approach make learning more student-centered? Group two, you'll have Haemba, Buki, and Wenjira. What advantages does the revised Bloom's taxonomy have over the original 19, 1956 taxonomy? Group three, what challenges are encountered in designing online activities? So, uh, you'll have Susan, Bessie, and Betty. Group four, what challenges will planners face in aligning outcomes, objectives, and learning activities of a course to make assessment effective? You have Eunice, Jocelyn. Group five, what informed your choice of the LMS learning management system? That's LMS learning management system at your university. What works well? What does not? You have Jared, Connie, and Walimbwa. Group six, what was your experience authoring multimedia content for your course? What tools did you use? What informed your choice of tools? What worked well? What did not? Remy and Natasha in that group. Group seven, what is the current situation of online learning in your institution? Is it synchronous, asynchronous, or both? What are the challenges and possible solutions? You have Ayatollah, Sanet, and Jonyo. Group eight, what institutional support mechanisms are necessary for online learning in universities? Um, any best practice examples? You will have Rafael, uh, Lea, and um, Obosi in that group. And group nine, what considerations would you make for gender, diversity, and inclusivity in designing your course? You have Ndidi, uh, Brenda, and just, uh, uh, Justine in that group. Group 10, what key considerations in course design would you enc would encourage active as opposed to passive learning? You'll have Kola and Olutayo in that group. The rest of the resource persons are dispersed in the groups. So if I've not mentioned any resource persons, don't be surprised to see them in the groups. Uh, the work of the resource persons is just basically to facilitate the discussion, but most of the discussion will be done by yourselves. Now, as I said before, you are going to be uh, automatically moved into groups. If you're not moved directly, um, just give me a, be patient for one minute. I'll be moving you into those groups. So see you in the groups. Remember, if you drop off, you go to breakout rooms, choose your room, go back. So it's important when you go to the room, you need to know which room it is. Resource persons kindly to two things, identify the room uh, for the participants, uh, identify, help them identify which room they're in. And also, secondly, um, do the recording of the groups. So see you in the rooms. Okay, if you're here, it means you're not in a room. So I need to send you a room. It means when I was allocating, you had dropped off. So let me start with the resource persons. Eunice, you are a priority for me because your people must be orphans now. Group four. Group four. Uh, who else is a priority for me? Um, Catherine, yeah, Bessie, Bessie, you are a, Bessie, I think you're in group three, no? Bessie, you are in priority for me as well. Who else is here as a priority for me? Um, 
No one else is a priority for me. All right, uh, Catherine, I'll most send you to group 10. All right, no. Okay, group nine, group nine, nine is uh, group six, group six, group 11, group 11, group, no, not group 11. All right, uh, 10, good. Everybody is in rooms. Can I join one? And switch off my video. Put up a slide explaining about how to join rooms and go discuss in rooms. <laughs> Uh, insert, new slide, blank slide, and come here and screen. Who is here? Who is here? I'm here. Catherine, Simon, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. I've sent you to a room, but you did not join. So go to breakout rooms. It and went up. Yes, I was logged off. I just come back now. It's been on and off. Yes, because I've sent you to a room already. So go to breakout rooms and click join. Okay, thank you. Perfect, thank you. And I need to do the screenshot. Where is the screenshot? The screenshot is here. No, no there. All right, click kill this and see if it appears. Voila. It is, it appears. And screenshot that. And come here and insert picture. Oh, no, 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 that's just the wrong slide. I need to go to home. Choose a different layout, this layout, and click there. And break documents and say that and do that. Choose your room here. Yeah. Rooms. Uh, join. Okay, design, design ideas. And Slide show on current slide.
Colleagues, please join rooms. Pechurio Casule, please join rooms. The procedure is right on the screen. Please join rooms.
to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Now we are back to the plenary. Can we take five minutes of a break um, as okay. those who are taking notes, you know, compile it together? So we that should be very good. Let's yes. break for five minutes. Please wait and take your you notes. Uh, what you do when you don't go yet? Don't go a moment, yet. Didi. What you do when you are taking the break? Please do not leave Zoom. Just keep uh, Zoom on. You just mute yourself. Switch off your video. Go grab a cup of tea. Um, in five minutes. Uh, five minutes before time we start. Didi, you can go ahead. Simon, then I'll invite, when you come back, Didi will take over five minutes before time. Simon, thank you for handling the breakout uh, seamlessly. You're much welcome. Thank you, Professor Ijonia. So is the break on now, Simon? Yes, it has, a minute has already been taken from your break. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have a break until five minutes before time. I don't want to say five minutes before one or before two because we're in two different time zones. Yes, okay. So Thanks. the next four minutes, the break will be over. John Oredo, do you have access to the Jamboard or you just have the, the notes? Should I send you the link? Would you like to use it for your presentation? Just a minute, okay. I can see the for question two is here. I'm wondering the one for question one. John, why are you wondering? No, I'm not wondering because Wanda is here, oh. but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> John, for question, for no, question, two, for question yeah. two, we had two very similar themes. That is the aha moments. One was from you. They were all about having a course I've, with learning outcomes and objectives. I've, for the I've written time. them down. I've written okay. them down. I was just checking if I could use the, the jump board. Okay. Yeah. If, if, you, if you can't, don't use it. It's okay. Yes. How, to, how to create? How to create? How to create? You, John, you should how be on. Create. You should. You should be on. Hey, coffee can you break. teach us how to create? No, no. I you don't have coffee. coffee. Wonder. Go on coffee break. Uh, no teaching. Uh, where is Gerard? Gerard is the chief of the jam board. <laughs> I I will. That short uh, break is very malicious. How can you tantalize us like that? Eh? No, we should we don't go have for that. Break. Nice coffee. <laughs> yeah, but, but who is giving us coffee? No, no, it's spiritual coffee. Oh. <laughs> now I give up. <laughs> when will I get the spiritual coffee? <laughs> <laughs> it will be done. It will, you'll get it asynchronously. <laughs> okay. Anyone who having the idea of how to create that jumbled so that we can learn it as we wait for those ones having break? Uh... Actually, yeah, go, I... to, go to Google. Let let Simon show you. Uh okay, okay. Um, all right, all right, all right. Let me just do it. Uh, Jared is not here, no. So let me show you them. Actually, we used it in our group. Jared is here. Uh, Jared is here. Jared, do you want to? Okay. Okay. Use us, 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 we used it. We used it. We don't. Why we, we used it in our group? John, all right. Yeah. So, so let, let's try. Let's try. It. So this is uh, so you. You, you need Google, uh, you have a Gmail, that's the hope. And then there are these always three dots here, which has all the Google applications available to you. So you click on the three dots and then you scroll down. Then there is Jamboard here. So just click on Jamboard. That's after you have logged in with your Gmail. Then click on Jamboard, uh, then it loads. Then there is the plus sign here. I have so many, but most likely you will not have any if you have not used them before with your Gmail, uh, you don't need Gmail. So you click on that, the add pattern. 
So you add one. So here now you can rename it, of course, uh, call it uh, Bedol uh, Design or something. And then just say, okay. And now you can change the background. I like black. So here, set background. So click on that and choose that. Then once you do that, to add another board, because this is just one board, you can see one over one. You can, you just use this create frame, create a new frame. So you see, I have now three of them, but each one of them has a white background. So let's go to number two. So I creating the, the board. The best way to actually create a new one with the same background is actually to click on this down arrow here and pick on the one you want to duplicate and right click on that and say duplicate. So I can continue doing that if I want that. Okay. If I want to remove, like I have a next one, just right click again, sorry, right click and say delete. It goes, delete. So you can do that. And what is more important, once you have created it, you can add a stick note, like say first board, and then you just save, then you have it there. And that's, you can always, you know, put it where you want and you can make it bigger by just uh, picking on this edge and dragging it, yeah? And then you can always add a picture and this picture can be from anywhere, most likely from your computer. So you just browse here to your computer and get it from your gadget. Or you can also search on the internet and I can search Nairobi uh, like that. And then there is an image which will come and I will say, oh, maybe I want that this one. So you just click on it. If you click on this one or this one and then just say insert. So you can actually add pictures from the internet straight away uh, onto your Jamboard. You see, resize it, make it bigger, drag it around and so on. Now, when it comes to sharing, you click on share, right? And you have to make sure that all the people you want to access it, I, they have rights. So you change this here, because now I want everybody here whom I don't have the address to access. So I would say anyone with the link should be able to access it, but not just view, but edit. So I say edit, and then I say done. So I go back here to share, and then I copy the link. I will put it on the chat, and then I know that for sure, you will be able to access it. So let me put the on the link and then you can try to do anything with that Jamboard which I've created. Thank you. I think this is more than the break. Thank you very much. Excellent. You have done a good Thank job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very Jared. much. Jared. Yeah, Jared, you always have Sorry, to, I just came Jared. I just came in the in the middle Jared. of the discussion. What do you use your Jamboard for? Would you like yes. to do something? Yes, so repeat John, a bit. John, John, are you ready with our Jamboard now? After the tutorial. Jared. <laughs> Jared, I've, we've also done a jam. Yes, I, I, have one, I have one ready. Okay. <laughs> that was the other one. I'll, the next one I'll talk because I also like talking. <laughs> Remy, maybe you must share my jamboard is dark. <laughs> that, that sounds weird. What's the jambo used for? for collaboration, yeah, yes. like you want all people to be able to collaborate whenever you are doing a, a project, like share their ideas and so on. Wow. I think, talk, Jared. I, wow. I, I, th I think what we do, Natasha, uh, if you agree, yeah. after once we are through with this session, we can, uh, those who are interested can stay on for maybe five minutes more and Jared will be happy to take you through the Jamboard again for those who are not following during the break. During the break, we decided to have our own private lesson with Jared. It's called Jamming with Jared. The lesson can be repeated five minutes after the session is over. So if you would like to know, if you still were not around or you still want more information about that, please, um, uh, after we are through the session, the whole session, uh, uh, don't log off. Jared will be able to Take again jamming with Jared for five minutes. <laughs> uh, and for Thank those who you. have jumbo board, 
Yeah, Simon yeah. will do that for me because I will have to give a talk at three. Simon will do that for me. I'm okay, sure. I will do it for. Yeah, on my behalf. Yes, thank you. Not come, but it's really be called jamming. With <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> All right. With Jared. And maybe just for the benefit of everyone, as I explained in our breakout group, as facilitators, we also continuously learn. It's lifelong learning. So it's a, a skill that we learned and we are trying out. So it might not even be perfect, but we are learning and we are learning with you. You know, so we continuously try and improve and bring in new things. And I'm so happy because I, I could see a number of damn boards. <laughs> Thank you, Natasha. Thank you. And Didi, now it's your session. You are recognized for the next 40 minutes. Didi. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I want to welcome us back from the head break. Incidentally, my light just went off. So let me off the video then. I hope you can all hear me loud and clear. I hope you enjoyed your various breakout sections. We had uh, 10 groups of... Uh, sections and uh, we deliberated. So in the next 35 minutes, we will be spending three minutes each on each of the group. Each group will present their first question, which is unique to the 10 groups. That means every group has its own, like we had earlier been informed. So each group will discuss issues that emerge from that particular discussion. For instance, in my group, group nine, we talked about gender. So you talk about your specific issue. Thereafter, you use just one second or two to tell us the aha moments recorded by one or two of your members. So can we start off? Which group is ready? Let me start with group one in the other elements. Thank you. Group one, please. Do you have the jump board? I sent you the link. Me? Would you want to see me? Group one. Okay. Group one, please. Okay. Hello, everyone. Christine, yeah. Um, Christine, can you share? Or else I'll share the screen. Let me share the screen. Okay. If All right. Why, why she's helping us to, why Esther is helping us to share the link? Uh -huh. Thank you. I am in group one. We were we had twelve participants. While right? the coordinator was Dr. Chris Mago from Ghana, and the recorder is Adebola from Makerere. Yeah, and it was it from Makerere. Um, it was um, facilitated by Esther Saki Dons, and that's our resource person. And our specific question is: To what extent does the outcome approach make learning more student centered? And we were able to discuss and that it teaches a course that has the objective of being applied by students when they get out into the laboratory world, the outcome approach clarify, clearly fits this objective. And also there are so many, many tools for teaching. All that is needed is an understanding of what's to be impaired, imparted and who it is being imparted to. Also, the outcome of the staff as a guide to the students and the lecturer. The outcome, not same as objective, and learning outcomes should be measurable or can be assessed as means to determine if learning has taken place. The summary of this is that the outcome approach serves as a guide to teacher, as a guide to students, and also as a guide of feedback, both to the teacher and the student of what these students have been able to learn. So that is one of the major um, purpose that the, the extent to which the outcome approach makes learning more student-centered. And on the second question is, on the second question is regards to the aha moment. We're able to, two of our, two of our participants were able able to present their course design. That is Dr. Chris Wago and Dr. Ghana, Dr. Ian Mama from University. And I have to try to distinguish, that means they are relating the outcome and the objective. That means being able to distinguish and relate the outcome 
to the objective was when she knew that ah, this is a new team I'm learning. So I, she was able to, she was guided by Esther that being able to write a sermon relating to the Old to the New Testament is a good outcome. Also for Dr. Olama, our own Amma moment was ability to be able to understand one continuous assessment. That means a continuous assessment is not just one of continuous assessment has to do with all those activities journal assignment that you put together in the course of the learning, of the, in the course of the class, of the teaching that makes the student to understand what he or she is learning. And the, the test can just be, at the end, a one of. Also, how to link outcomes to objective was also a, a hard moment as she was, and the two of them were really assisted and given more clarification by Esther. So that's what we did in group one. Thank you. Yeah, that was a very good one. Group one, that was a very good one. Congratulations, you have done well. Thank you. Thank you. So in conclusion, we, we, you said that uh, outcome approach is very good. I'm sure you can yes. see that. Yes, ma'am. It does, it's very good because it helps, it serves as a guide to the teacher, as a guide to the student, and also as a guide for feedback of both of the teacher and the students. So it's a very good approach. Yes, thank you very much. Please, uh, uh, group two, can you share with us in the next two minutes your what you came out with? Yes, for group two, um, we didn't have the fancy technology, so we didn't use the fancy stuff. We looked at the advantages of the new Bloom's taxonomy. And then as a group, some of the advantages that were discussed was um, the new Bloom's taxonomy is important to outline learning objectives in order for the students as well as the, the, the lecturers. And then one of the uh, participants said um, it's pretty much creates a solid foundation, what you'd see as a blueprint um, indicating where one can start and where ends as based on that building block, if you look at it as a blueprint, uh, one is able to create activities and design instructional strategies. And we looked at the, uh, we debated about the, um, the new verb that was introduced to create, um, replacing, synthesize, and this um, pretty much is, um, although it was agreed that the new verb replaces the old one synthesize, the argument was one cannot create without synthesizing. So pretty much the new one gives us that idea and students are able to create. It's also more student centered as opposed to teacher centered. So all the design of the material is more um, from the student point of view. In terms of the aha moments that came up, two colleagues or three did present their outlines and we received feedback from the hosts and some of the aha moments were in the description where um, most of us, if I could generalize, had not considered when we're describing the audience, hadn't considered a few elements like the location and the geopolitics or the gender. So it was one of those aha moments where you design something and you don't put into consideration how many people are expected for the module and where they're coming from and what it is to consider. The other aha moment came into the, in terms of objectives, where the most of the objectives were not reduced to the four types of knowledge that our professor had discussed in the session. That's it for group two. Thank you very much, group two. That was a very, very good uh, interactive section you had. Please, uh, group three, can we have your presentation? There's a, there's a, quest, there's a request here yeah, on the chat but that if you are speaking, you put on your video, your meet. But I had earlier pleaded that I should be excused from meet because they just took the light where I, want, where I am in the office. So it's very dark. But for other speakers, 
kindly put on your video when you speak. My apologies for that. I could show the face after the presentation if that's fine. I'm sure everyone can see me. Yes. Thank you. Yes. So my name is Joaquin for group three. Can I go ahead? Yes. Please go ahead. We, can, we are listening. All right. So we looked at we looked at the, what challenge designing online led by as our first key point. How to avoid. I, I don't think we can't can, see or hear. I don't think it will work. It's really bad. It's dropping. Can someone in your group present if your own network is not working fine? The Who else is in your group? Can someone else from your group take over the presentation? Or we can move to the next one, come back to it now. Okay, please. Yeah. Uh, Schedule. Yes. Can we have the other group present, please? It's bad. The next group, you, please. Group, group four? Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? No, we, ca yes. we can hear you, but very you friendly. Hear me. And it is no, your network oh, is still sorry. not okay. Maybe uh, take some time. We'll, we'll come back to you, Joachim. Group four. Group three will come back because their network is fluctuating. Okay, I'm presenting for group uh, four. I'm John Oredo from University of Nairobi. Let me just uh, share our Jamboard. I guess you can see it. Yes, our question was, uh, to identify ways of aligning outcomes, objectives, and learning expectations um, of a course to make assessment effective. And in the brainstorming session, we came up with what we can see on the Jamboard that design the learning activities that meet the outcomes, learning outcomes. Um, creating a sequence, all the four components should be linked, focus on skill development, assessment should be drawn from the learning activities, outcomes should be central um, as you design, and then also frame student expectations clearly, in the process of framing student expectations, you also reconcile those expectations with the course objectives. And then finally, shift attention from exams by assessing uh, practical activities. So those were some of the points uh, we got as a way of aligning outcomes, um, objectives, and learning expectations of a course to make assessment uh, uh, effective. I think what was central is that learning activities uh, should be geared towards uh, making uh, um, assessment effective. The aha moment uh, was uh, one colleague shared that for the first time in his teaching life, he's having both objectives and outcomes as separate sections of uh, the course outline. Another colleague uh, shared uh, the interesting thing that for the first time he could uh, <clears throat> indicate means which he's going to use to support the learners. He, has al he, he always knew that he would want to support learners, but this time he was able to list specific means by which he was going to support the learners. 
we were also interested in the opposite of aha moment, but that's a story for another day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Group 4. You are highly appreciated. I like the efforts. And I'm sure that other colleagues will appreciate your efforts at aligning the objective with the learning outcome and the assessment, as well as the activities. It was very, very explicit. I want to call on group five, except if group three, if their in network is now stable. Otherwise, let's proceed to group five. Group five, please. Who is representing group five? Okay, I'll, I'll present for group five. Um, Hassan, are you there? Yes, okay. we are here. Mm, give me just a moment. Yeah, so um, this is group five. Uh, we looked at the learning management system and we looked at what informed the choice of the LMS at our university, what works well, what doesn't. Um, that was the main question we were looking at. Um, and so you can see that these were the different universities represented in our group. Um, Makere, Nairobi, Lagos, Ghana, um, Uganda, Matters University. And most of the learning management systems were the learning management systems were either Moodle or Sakai, with Moodle being the, the commonest and Sakai being used mostly by University of Ghana. So this is what we used. We had a jam board that had um, different boards. So what works well here is what people shared. Um, the first is that you can integrate multimedia content like videos and images. The other is that you can upload resource materials, conduct quizzes, assignments, and, manage, and assignment management. Uh, the third was flexibility, so learners can access the material anytime. And then the other one was the discussion forums and the wikis work really well. Um, and then we went on to discuss what does not work well, which is kind of like the challenges. And we had a number here as well. Learners cannot be reprimanded with appropriate tone of voice because of course you're kind of not working in real time or you know face to face. Then there was server limitations. Uh, so bandwidth limitation resulting in a system crash when large students join at the same time. Uh, and this is experienced by most of us as we were in the group. Then we had poor student attendance and one member explained that he really doesn't understand what the real challenges are for the students because even when he puts up the, the videos and leaves them online for like forever, they'll still not uh, watch the videos. Yes, even if it was face-to-face, -face, perhaps they would come to class and not be there, uh, but still be present. But even now with everything that's going on, it's difficult to understand why there's poor student um, attendance. And then we have um, resistance and attitudes from both students and lecturers. Some people just haven't accepted the fact that we are moving online especially forced by the COVID-19 pandemic. So, so they still drag their feet and don't want to move. Lastly, were our aha moments. Um, the first was um, the first, uh, someone who shared that they discovered their uh, activity called workshop on the Moodle LMS during design. And wow, um, he was so impressed with the way the students interact with the activity and gave uh, one particular student um, gave a, a very critical uh, peer review of another's work, you know, step by step and critiqued the entire animation which they had produced. And then um, another person shared that her, her, her moment was learning the difference between learning outcomes and learning objectives. And then lastly, uh, we had the person who shared that they were so excited to discover 
by the grade book and how easy it makes grade computation. And he demonstrated to us using a course that he has um, designed and worked with previously. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present. Yeah, that was a very, very good one. I, I must say that I'm particularly impressed at the mention of uh, attitude and values towards uh, the online. And I'm sure that uh, in that group, you all saw the need to, to encourage colleagues to change their negative attitude towards online course facilitation, course design and assessment. I hope you did that with your team in your group. group five. Yes, we did. Thank you. Yes. You address values, which are just major hindrance. Now, uh, can we have group six or... Is group three ready to, pre to, represent, to present or represent whichever way? Three group three. Here. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Group three is here. It's still very, it's still not very, very clear. Can someone, or maybe you should remove your mouth. Uh, we can hear. We can hear. We can hear. Okay, please we go ahead. We can hear perfectly. Okay, that's very good. Please go ahead. Except he should remove his mask. Yes, I think he's the mask. Please go ahead, group three, we can hear you. <laughs> All right. So we looked at what challenges are encountered in designing an online learning activity. And a few key points came out. One is how to avoid monotony. Um, we found that it is very easy to keep repeating the same set of activities in trying to elicit diff perhaps different responses. The second one was about how to align the different activities so that you can meet the objectives that and the expected outcomes of, of learning that you have set out for yourself or the students. Um, and tied to this is how you can use assessments, feedback to be able to achieve this. We found that this is a bit difficult and perhaps it's because we are also a bit new to, to online learning. Um, Another question that came out clearly was how to find us. And also that we felt that we, I mean, not everybody, but the majority of us are not too familiar with the systems yet. So our inability to navigate the online platforms completely, we're, we're for now hindering our capacity to deliver complete, complete or holistic learning. Tied to all this is the perennial problem of poor internet that has bedeviled me this morning. And the fact that during this course in particular, and while we have had to do these activities, some people are having to multitask because previous activities uh, have had to, to be ongoing. So these are some of the key things that came out and that have, have, have been identified as challenges encountered during the design of online learning activities. Um, regarding AHA movements, two key ones stood out. Um, the first one was that following the design of um, an activity and, 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 and a, a deadline for assessment, um, and a lot of students came back asking for an extension. So what do you do? Um, if you haven't thought about this before, how do you set about to allow this to happen and not disadvantage um, those who have already satisfactorily completed the assignment, for instance? And then secondly, that if you design something and that you need to put out there, say a video or something like that, it is important that you look at it again critically and be very happy with it before you post it because you don't want the situation where when you posted it and this has happened then you find that it's not exactly or it's not saying exactly what you wanted to communicate so these were the two aha moments that came out clearly from our discussions thank you very much yes thank you that was a good one group three you are you actually did a very good work can i call on group six to briefly tell us what the outcome of your discussion as well as the aha moment in two minutes thank you thank yeah. Thank you very much. Um, group six, we shared our experiences in using multimedia tools and what informed the choice of those tools, what were some of our challenges, what worked and what didn't work. Well, um, quite a number of us agreed that this gave us an opportunity to try out all these new multimedia tools. And one of our colleagues even stated that um, she was more of a traditional teacher, but this kind of provided a new learning process for her. And um, what we realized was that we all um, learned how to use tools such as um, 
the um, link web pages. We learned how to use PDF files and record our lessons, usually put them on audio. We also try to use videos from YouTubes and we try to use links to internet readings um, and slide presentations as well. Um, what we realized was that a lot of the choice of these tools was informed by um, the outline of our courses and the objectives, as well as the outcomes we wanted for our students. So at the end of the day, picking a particular resource or a particular reading web link, all was dependent on what outcomes we wanted for the students. And we tried to ensure that the outcomes matched um, some of the choice of tools that we used. Then again, um, we realized that um, once one colleague remarked that he was quite interested in how he could use PowerPoint um, for interactive, as, inter as an interactive ch channel in his lecture, in his lecture or in his lectures. Yes, and so he was excited to learn new ways to use PowerPoint to author an interactive course. Then again, um, we tried to go through one of our colleagues' um, course design template for a blended and online course. And so she taught principles of open and distance learning. We looked at her delivery mode, her course objectives, her expected learning outcomes. And we tried to find out whether they were aligned in terms of the learning activities and the learning outcomes as to whether they were all aligned to the um, assessment methods as well as the design to assessing the learning outcomes. But then we also noted that, and she noted that it was just um, a design in process and she was going to try and amend it to ensure that they all tallied. We also realized that learner support was very key and very important in some of these things. Our aha yes. moment, we had a few aha moments. I'll just mention two of them. Um, one of our colleagues um, noted that um, she's been able to now break the technological phobia by being able to try all these tools. And using these processes enables us to get closer to our learners. And then also we are able to focus on the content more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we have group seven now? Group seven, yes. Yes. Uh, the task reads, what's the situation of online learning in your institution? Uh, it was agreed that almost all institutions use both synchronous and asynchronous sessions. Though the depth of usage differs from institution to institution and also per department. <laughs> However, all facilitators are encouraged to use both synchronous and asynchronous sessions. Uh, in some institutions, it was observed, it was, uh, uh, observed that uh, they use Zoom platform, but uh, the facilitators say that they are challenged with, uh, with, the stu with the students who don't want to talk, students who are dormant during Zoom sessions. And uh, somehow, it's a kind of negatively impact on the teacher, on the lecturer or facilitator's performance. Uh, more so, uh, the situation of e-learning. Uh, some some institutions, in addition to Zoom, they use Moodle platform. Uh, Moodle complements Zoom uh, during the teaching learning process. Uh, however, it was discovered that uh, some options are not tapped. Uh, there are other tools. Uh, there are other tools that can be used instead of just using the Moodle platform just for as a as a repository and for positing announcements. Facilitators encouraged to use uh, to to tap into other tools such as the blog, the discussion fora, the quiz etc, instead of just using Moodle for, as a repository and for posting announcements. Uh, more to the situation of the e-learning, uh, people have complained about the poor connect internet connectivity that, uh, that uh, impacts on the learning process. However, there are suggestions that were made. We've come up with suggestions uh, in situations where students are dormant or learners are dormant, facilitators are 
advised to tag a reward for active participation. It could be in form of marks, in for anything one could think of, or a punishment, for instance, for leaving the room before task is accomplished. Anything one can think of, but as a, but tagging a reward or a punishment to to a given situation, and more to learners being dormant. Uh, facilitators also advise to use the question approach. Question approach still it goes back to tagging of a reward or a punishment. Uh, basing on the on the discussion, we also came up. We also agreed that there is more need for training of both staff and students on the use of the e platform learning platforms. Uh, someone suggested that. Uh, for instance, at the start of a Zoom class or a Zoom meeting, Zoom lecture, it would also be good to create a relaxing environment at the start, as this would help to shed off the fears and laxity, or laxity uh, learners may could have come with to, to class, give class a wide interpretation. Uh, about the aha. Uh, Moments, share it with us, please. Yes, the aha moments, the aha moments. Yeah. Uh, it was observed that uh, some of our colleagues who do not have an, an education background have aligned the objectives and learning outcomes, the, the objectives to the learning outcomes for the first time, especially those who didn't have the learning uh, and education background. Uh, some have not even we've, we've discovered that some have not yet submitted the course outlines though they are trying finally uh, uh someone shared that is aligning she aligned the course outline to the new normal of the blended courses that is to fit well in the e-learning environment that's what we, i captured for group seven thank you ah that was a group a very very awesome representation you made for your group. Thank you. You are highly appreciated, yes. Thank you we very much. On, yeah, we call on group eight to come and share with us what they have discussed in your group. Um, thank you very much, uh, Peace Musimenta from Makerere University, Uganda. Uh, in our group eight, we had two questions. And the first one was, what institutional support mechanisms are necessary for online learning in universities? And we are requested to also share best practices from our individual institutions. And um, participants uh, in that group gave a variety of uh, support mechanisms <clears throat> ranging from infrastructure support in terms of the technology enhanced gadgets, ICT training for both students and faculty, uh, institutions that should <clears throat> train and conduct uh, training for, uh, for online learning. Um, another one gave that, that there is need for student support service and uh, that some institutions, um, institutions provide data to lecturers to smoothly provide online learning. But uh, the, another one gave a uh, mindset change uh, through rigorous sensitization as key um, mechanism. And another one gave reduction in workload by employing st more staff uh, as one of the mechanisms. And another one suggested an institutional uh, policy framework. Um, and another, uh, another participant uh, uh, suggested conducting orientation for online platforms as it is a new, something new to many of us. Um, others uh, gave the practices that have worked in, in one of the universities <clears throat> where staff are given data. Uh, that one uh, in, in, in Ghana and in Uganda, U, U, M, University, UMU. Um, then there was also suggestion that uh, there is need for institutional partnerships to share learnings so that we learn from each other. Uh, and and the, the zero rating um, by 
service providers like MTN, um, those that provide internet data uh, has, has also worked in, in some of the universities, including Makere University. Um, the aha moment, no, no. The, the best exam, uh, uh, learn, uh, examples or practices, um, provision of desktops that have speakers and that would help be helpful to avoid using earpieces because in some colleagues work together in the same offices. Um, then, then we also uh, suggested in stable internet connectivity, and you could all see you could all see how it was disrupting us even here. So th th those are some of the highlights that um, Group Eight suggested as key support mechanisms necessary for online learning in universities. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Group Eight. Then, I, then we, our aha moment. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Yes, we also had our aha moments. Uh, many of us uh, ability to use other um, elements. In one, in one second. Yes, yeah, such as Google Classroom, uh, others uh, understanding how to create a course in Moodle, others how to, the realization of applying constructive alignment and, 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 uh, and many others have really made our day and as our aha moments. Thank you. In Thank summary, you very much, Group Eight. I am sure that others are particularly impressed by the fact that institutions realize that they have a role to play. It's just that they provided these various roles in different dimension and different quantity and quality. Thank you once again. Can we have Group Nine present to us? Okay, Group Nine. I would just like to share my slides, and I hope you can see them. So for group nine, our question, question one was to look at considerations you would make for gender diversity and inclusivity in designing your course. And I would just go through the major considerations. For gender, um, in designing your course, you need to consider issues that cut across both genders. And um, also consider that in like a male dominated um, class, you need to encourage female participants to respond. You need to ensure that your language is sensitive to both genders. And in our group, we advocated the use of plural pronouns like they, you know, so that it doesn't, um, it, it, uh, pro it promotes, inclusivity for the genders. And then also in selecting your media, you have to ensure that it's not stereotyped. And for diversity and inclusivity in particular, we saw that you need to consider your audience. Um, is it predominate, uh, even if it is lightly English speaking or lightly French speaking, you have to look at minority uh, students who may not be speaking those languages. We also considered including breaks for uh, Muslim students who might need to pray. And then you would also need to consider students with disabilities. For instance, you may want to share a video for a visually impaired student, and that, therefore you need to consider an alternative as regards your learning materials. And then um, your choice of materials also, you may need to consider the place of color graphics, just to make the learning interesting. And um, an important case was cited, for instance, if you are taking a political, um, uh, a class, a political science, for instance, and you need to put out your points properly so that you do not bring dissenting views, which will discourage um, some people with their biases from learning. And then for inclusivity, you need to consider affordability of, um, and availability of internet facilities, uh, learning materials like smartphones and data. Uh, so in, in conclusion, gender di uh, diversity and inclusivity need to be considered because the impact facilitation and delivery. So this needs to be built in to the design. As regards our hard moment, I've cropped the, uh, the jam board and you would see some interesting things that were raised one of our group members just said, the ability, being able to upload 
materials like links and files is an aha moment for him. Something he's learned from the course. Being able to upload a YouTube presentation. I think two people mentioned that it just struck them that they could differentiate between uh, objectives and learning outcomes. And that the fact that we need to consider um, being flexible and gender, gender sensitive also was one major thing for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Group 9. That was a very, very elaborate and illustrative presentation you had. Thank you. So, thank you for representing us very well. <laughs> <laughs> Can I call on the last, but not the least group, and that is Group 10. Okay, this is group 10. Uh, our question was in the key considerations in the course encourage active rather than passive learning. And here briefly they are, in order to encourage participation of learners, we need to choose appropriate teaching and learning strategies like case study, role play, brainstorming, discussions, group work and group projects. But also we can post questions on the discussion forum and encourage students to, to respond. In that way, they'll keep active during the course. But on the, on the assessment bit of it, we need to give a constructive feedback that would encourage students to continue working hard and, and, and learning. We need to develop a motivating welcome message at the beginning of the course so that they, they, they begin to see the value, they pick interest in learning this course and that will make them participate. Another thing we could also state learning outcomes that promote activities by use of active verbs, like design something, apply that knowledge, be able to discuss and evaluate. So that during the teaching and learning moment, when we focus on that, then the students will be able to participate. Then we need to, to focus on the role of motivation in the teaching and learning process so that when there is a behavior that has been exhibited that needs to be appreciated, we need to do it appropriately. And we also need to encourage students to share their experiences in class as much as possible so that they, they, they begin to see that they can contribute to the knowledge that is being generated in class and can also apply it in their life situation. And then we need to let learners introduce themselves right at the beginning of the class so that when they're put in groups, they already know themselves and they have no fear. Our aha moment, I'm going to pick only three out of the many that we had. And one of them was being able to incorporate participatory delivery method of teaching and learning in the course. This person has ever taught this course, but the methods were not participatory. And then another one was being able to incorporate videos from YouTubes and TED Talk that matched the course content, some of the, the, the courses, the, the topics that were being presented. And then to discover that the learning outcome do not align with the course content. So this person is going to redesign the learning outcome to be able to align with the course content. Thank you so much. Thank you, group 10 for that presentation. Any other contributions, comments, observation? I don't think we have any. So, Simon. Um, thank you, thank you, Ndidi. Thank you, Ndidi. Uh, Natasha, it's uh, next to take over now. Yes, according to the plan. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, I'm just going to put my video on. I hope people can see me. I'm having trouble with my internet, but it's my privilege to really um, conclude with um, the take-home message from the entire online design session that you've gone through. And I must say that it has been really very enlightening and valuable, all the presentations that came to the fore this morning. And I really want to commend on um, words like the, the use of technology, inclusivity, alignment. Um, those are really words that we all have to use in this online environment. So um, my task is then to ask if there are any questions from anybody in the room. 
um, regarding the um, online design session. And if there are any take home messages from anybody in the audience that they would like to share with the rest of um, the participants. So can I ask for anybody to share? Um, Hello. There's a raised Hello. hand. John, you can actually go ahead. Great, thank you. I would like to comment on the very last point raised by um, the group that presented. They talked about asking students to introduce themselves, which I agree perfectly with. But my question is this. In this semester, I will be teaching a group of 396 undergrad students. How, how can I go about that creatively and, and not waste, quote and unquote, the time? Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for that question. Is there anybody that would like to venture an answer? Um, then, John, maybe from my side, I would like to suggest um, we've seen these wonderful jam boards that came up. There's other technologies such as Padlet. Um, and when we do training with lecturers, we ask them to introduce themselves using that technology. Um, so it won't take any time away from, from your lecturing time, but it would give um, the rest of the class access to um, information regarding their, their uh, fellow students. And you can use that um, to introduce everybody in the class. Maybe um, you, can, you can try that with, with a large class like the one you have. Thank you, I'm so grateful. It's a big pleasure. Is there anybody else? I saw other hands. Um, I can't see anybody now with a hand up. Is there anybody? Richard, um, you've got your hand up. Yes, I, uh, there's something I raised in the chat just for clarification on the issue of uh, the Bloom's taxonomy vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the Fiki's taxonomy of significant learning. Uh, there are some things that link the two because I've seen some scholars emphasizing that uh, uh, the Fikis taxonomy brings out the real element of learning because the focus significant learning and not much on the content. Could there be some link between Bloom's taxonomy and the Fikis taxonomy? Then the other thing I wanted just to request, especially the, 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 the prof who led the group 10 who was, I, I, I realized there was a, a mix up of things because people are giving different aspects on the difference between learning objectives and learning outcomes. I don't know whether he could come in just to make clarity because I realized when the colleagues were giving, were giving different views. So that is very clear and how they, link I submit. Thank you very much for that. Um, can I ask that um, the person who presented, sorry, I can't remember the names now, just also then answer this question. Or is there anybody else in the audience? Just clarification on the Bloom te uh, taxonomy. Maybe Professor Heimba. Yeah, please. So oh, I'm sorry. I must have left. Um, Leo, Patricia, one of you want to take over? Take the. Um, Simon, thanks. I could do. I, I missed. Uh, my internet was shaking. I missed the question on Brooks, Bloom's taxonomy, but I could uh, clarify on the course objectives and learning outcome. If the question was clarified, I, I my internet was shaking, so I missed the question on. Bloom's taxonomy, but let me say, uh, let me clarify how I how how we differentiate course objectives and course learning outcomes. And then you can first of all realize that you can have these objectives and learning outcomes at course level, which is like uh, the general course, like you, your course you are teaching. It could be uh, maybe class one to zero the course that you teach. So at the level of the course, you can have course objectives and course learning outcomes, the way we are learning them here. Then also for the session, that one lesson that you are going to teach, you can also have course, sorry, session objectives and session learning outcomes. So I like to look at it 
like two sides of one coin. So the course objectives are what the course expects to achieve, like the aims of the course. So that is from the side of the course, the course objectives. So these are the things that you would like in terms of uh, knowledge, skills, values to develop as a course. Then on the other side are the learning outcomes. Those are like literally the results from learning and they're from the perspective of the learner. So what is the learner able to do successfully to demonstrate that they have learned? that they have mastered the intentions of the course, which were the course objectives. So we look at them as two sides of the same coin. They are all about intentions, intentions of the course and the course objectives, and then the actual evidence that the learners have learned are the learning outcomes. So are, are they, what are the things they can do what are the, in terms of the skills, what are the things they have learned? And so it has to do with some action they are doing. Can they explain? Can they describe? Can they develop a strategy? Can they um, maybe communicate something? So we look at this as two sides of the coin. One are the intentions of the course or the teacher. Those are the objectives and the other are the on the perspective of the learners, what they have actually learned as a result of engaging in the course. Thank, Thank you, you very much for that. Um, does that clarify your question regarding the outcomes and the objectives? Okay. Yes. The answer is clear. It is clear. It is clear. Okay, and then as soon as Professor Kahemba has, has joined us, we will ask him then just to clarify on the Bloom question that you've asked. Professor is in here, but I don't think you got oh. the question yet. I'm here, you can ask now. You can ask your question regarding the uh, Bloom's uh, taxonomy. Hello? That was Richard who asked. Richard, would you like to rephrase your question? Okay, I'm going to move to the other, there were other people that participants who had their hands up. Is there another question from the group? Are there, are there any other participants that would like to ask a question or who would like to share their take home message from the entire um, design sessions that they've attended. Nobody. Is, are there any of the resource people that would like to add anything to this um, take home message? I think then from my side, I, I just wanted to add a few things and that is that I think in all the, the discussions we've seen today that it, it's not only about, it's not about technology, it is about the teaching and that you as the lecturer is still in charge. And I think one of the big things that, that we must keep in mind that um, no matter what technology you use, you must still have a strong presence in your online classrooms and that must be a goal so that the students are not left on their own, but that you still facilitate the whole process. And I think that one of the things that we also picked up in our groups was that one has to communicate. You have to communicate clearly, effectively, and frequently, because remember, you're not there in person so that students can understand what is expected from them and how they should uh, progress through the, um, the course. And then um, lastly, I just want to once again say that one of our biggest um, issues that was raised in, in group seven was participation. That is really a big challenge to get students participating. So your course must be developed in such a way that you have some interactivity, that maybe you use some game-based principles, because that will make your course also much more enjoyable and fun for some students. And that will then also help to get them more engaged. So thank you very much for this opportunity and I wish you all well. And then the last thing I just wanna say that, please, you must all reach out. You have all been assigned a tutor. You can ask your colleagues, 
Um, we noticed also that some people are still struggling doing their online course, but please don't feel alone. You are welcome to ask for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanet. Natasha, you want to invite uh, Dr. Bossi and Raphael to um, give a conclusion, and then we can uh, have um, have um, and, um, um, Yes, speaking there, there is Raphael and Joseph that will be um, almost taking us home before we see Mama Pedal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, members. Uh, colleagues, I think we have um, come to um, the conclusion um, stage where I just want to share with you uh, what we have done so far. And Joseph will have an overview, uh, will have um, a wrapping word for you. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, come from uh, far. I think uh, what we have done was to just to look at uh, how do we teach and um, uh, the issue related to teaching and how to organize your teaching. We've looked at the issues related to um, learning, objective, outcome, how to align everything around, around your, to, to, to your, your outcome so that you get the results that you need. And we have actually looked at very many things from synchronous uh, session and are synchronous on the platform where we have had a lot of uh, feedback from ourselves, feedback from yourself. And I think we have picked something and um, we are able now to look at uh, various strategies and tools uh, when you want to teach, what strategies would you like to put in place? And I, I know that all of us have uh, different a platform in our university, you can be able to know which uh, technology can go with what strategy that you, you are able to pick on. We have, even in this session, we have actually had a lot of feedback from ourselves peer to peer. And uh, also we have had uh, a peer to resource person. And uh, I think this is enhancing our position to, to be able to, to design the online education uh, program. So where are we uh, heading now? We are going now to uh, a facilitation. Um, facilitation is also another very exciting uh, session that you're going to experience, both uh, synchronously and uh, syn synchronously. We are also going to uh, engage ourselves in a lot of um, discussion on the forum, we are also going to look at suitable tools and um, technologies that can be used for, um, for, for facilitation. So we are going to examine and evaluate a lot, which one can we use in our university? And also we are going to look at the, to look at what we planned uh, and see how do we pick the best strategy? What works and what does not work? These strategies, all of them have been tested. They are able to deliver, but you need to know what uh, learning objective do you need to pair with which strategy for the best results. We are also going to share ideas online uh, on the on the synchron on the plot platform. We are also going to evaluate uh, each other and uh, get a lot of uh, support from ourselves, and uh, both online and um, uh, 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 synchronously, like what we are doing. This is a, a very exciting uh, uh, stage where we are going. Uh, facilitation, we are going to use your uh, session plan an area which you need to maybe allocate seven minutes and present to us and teach us. It's very, very exciting. We learn a lot from each other. 
And uh, this is where now I have also learned a lot from, uh, from colleagues who are teaching various sections. So th this is a, a platform where we need to get feedback on what we will now take to the, to the practice out there. But apart from that, there's certain things that I need to mention that from 16th of September up to 20th, you, we will actually be meeting you asynchronously on the platform. And uh, we, I want to encourage you to, to visit the, the platform and be able to, uh, to, 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 to respond to the tasks on the, on the platform. We'll, you'll get us there. We'll be able to support you. We'll be able to also um, maybe challenge you to think. And um, also, we will also like to learn from you. And uh, from 21st um, of September, we'll have uh, the second uh, live uh, session. And uh, this, is, this will be asynchronously, and uh, we'll meet here in the, in the Zoom. And we'll be able to do what we have done today. And this is this helps us to to go deep to to dive deep into understanding the technologies that are there, the uh, the pedagogy strategies and approaches that we can actually pick and uh, be able to, to 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 ensure that our students achieve the, their learning outcome. Um, on Friday. Uh, we will be able to go now deep into uh, micro teaching. That is on 24th, micro teaching. And this is where now we'll uh, want, uh, maybe we will request that you, out of what you've designed, you pick a section uh, which you'll facilitate for about uh, uh, 10 minutes. You'll not tell us, but you'll teach us. You will make us your student, and uh, you'll also. Uh, um, try to motivate us to engage into whatever you'll be teaching us. Uh, apart from that, we also encourage that um, uh, submission of session plan uh, to be done, and uh, this is uh, due on 18th. Please uh, uh, ensure that he, this is, is done. And therefore, I think I want to thank you for uh, engaging with us, both uh, on the platform and uh, on this uh, uh, the, during this session, and I've, I'm looking actually forward to more engagement uh, online and um, more questions and uh, learning from you and also learning from each other. I want to invite uh, Obosi to uh, say uh, maybe to wrap up with a comment. Uh, Joseph? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rafael. And uh, thank you very much, colleagues and participants. It is nice to come to conclusion after, uh, let me call it a day well spent. And the conclusion which Raphael has done has become much more elaborate and even much more enticing as it prepares you for the next level facilitation, which will be next week. That notwithstanding, because probably he might have prepared another slide, but I just want to give an overview of what he has said in short in less than one minute. What do we, we have been doing course design? The question you asked, what and how? Now we have designed, but what have we learned across? What is new in terms of design? Have we observed and learned that the institutions cutting up across Africa, each and every member participants here was able to design a course doesn't that tell us that course design is not institution specific, but wherever you are, you can do it. All institutions have embraced this new online technology. The level at which the institutions are differ. That brings in the concept of the infrastructure. 
and the motivation that goes with it. That's what informs at what level we'll succeed and how fast or slow we will be moving towards the online pedagogy, which at the moment is not a matter of debate in terms of do we or don't we. And to that extent, we want to also appreciate that the level of students is also a key factor in course design, just as much as the strategies, to the extent that not all strategies work in all instances. As the course designer, you need to know what gear to engage. Why do we do that? I want to conclude in one sentence that having done a very wonderful, appropriate and beautiful uh, course design, do you remember or can you imagine that without appropriate strategy to facilitate, your good work shall come to no fusion at all. So please ensure that your design incorporates appropriate strategy to facilitate the delivery. Otherwise, thank you very much for the participation and listening. And I will hand over back the responsibility to Natasha. Thank you. Natasha? Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Rafael. And um, I'm the lucky one to hand it over back to Mama Pedro. Mama, give us some love, some Pasha love. Let's spread the good message. And um, thank you all. The session was on fire. Let's keep this momentum going. Mama, you ta you're taking us home. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, before we lose uh, a few other colleagues, please let's have a photo. Uh, kindly just give us a few minutes to take a photo together. Simon, are you there? And you don't really want to miss Mama's hug. This is what brings out the person in us. This is what connects us from north to south, to east to west, to settle together, sharing the love we have for our students to become the next generation of special quality graduates who will move our continent to the next level. So we're going to join together to share some love, to share some energy that will move us into course facilitation. Simon, the photo. Sure, please let's switch on our cameras, hide subtitles, good. Let's switch on our cameras. Uh, uh, move that, move that, good. All right, we have three screens. Okay, let me just move the chat on the side. It's my baby. Okay, so everybody switch on your camera. Look at what you look like because this is what your students will also see. <laughs> <laughs> That's you are correct. So you say jackfruit. Uh, oh, yes. I this is a nice one. Well, beautiful. I'll put these photos in the folder, in the design folder. Okay. Right now, in case you need to download them. Done. Let me upload them before I forget. Okay, so how do you know a pedalist from <clears throat> Sierra Leone to Pretoria? When you meet them, they'll give you the pedal moment. So let's go. It's three, 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 three right hand, left hand, right leg, left leg, and then mwah. Okay, so let's go. One, two, three. Okay, one, two, three. One, two, two three. Right leg, one, two. Left two, leg, three. one, two. two okay. Three. Wow. <laughs> now, finally, Mama's hug. As you pedal away in the night, know that Mama will be thinking about you. Okay? Mm -hmm. You will not be alone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye.
Thank you. Bye. 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 All right, jam with Jare. Session All starts right. now. Who wants to be in here? It will take to. five minutes. Maybe we give them 10 seconds, those who want to depart, or maybe we start and then they can depart us. They can start thinking whether they need it or not. Uh, yeah, just to start. Minutes. God. Nay, Lulu, start. Let's just do this. Start. Jamming. Let's do more. Yeah. All right, let's uh, do this then. Just opening my browser. Okay, um, let me share my screen. Jam with Jerry. Uh, there. All right, uh, here we go. This is your, your Gmail. You go to these three dots. Go to those three dots, these ones. Okay. When you go to these three dots, you will look for something written Jamboard. So there is one of the apps called Jamboard. Let me scroll down. Um, aha, voila, there it is right there, Jamboard. So remember when you're creating the e-portfolio, we said you go to sites, but this time we're going to Jamboard, this one, all right. I have so many Jamboards. You may not have many, any or you may have few. So what you do is you click on this plus. It's called the new jam, this one. I can see it, please. Can you move your cursor so that I will see where you are? All right. Can you see it now? There's a plus sign here, cross, down here. Bottom, it's bottom, bottom right. Here, can you see it? Yes, yes, I can see it. Okay. This is what you click yeah. on for oh, all Google okay. services. Okay. This is the universal sign of Google to mean something new. The okay. plus sign, the cross, the plus, mm -hmm. the addition sign. So you click on it. Mm -hmm. It has given you a new jam. This is what you call the new jam. Now, Jamboard is made up of slides. So this is the first slide. And then, so you see mm -hmm. one of one. If you want to add another slide, you just click on this arrow here. Then it will add you another slide. But let's start with the first. So with this, there are things you can do. You can set the background by just clicking background there. You can choose a color. Let's say the blue, blue board. You can stop there or you can add other things. You can add your question, for example. Okay. So I want to add a question. A question is text. So this text box, T, right? But before, yeah, so that's the question. I want to ask my question. Okay, for example, my students, I want to ask them, well, maybe it's just simple. Please introduce yourself. Okay, depending on the color you've chosen, it may, uh, you can choose the, yeah, where is the F? So. You can choose the, the font color there and maybe say white. So let's white on like that. Okay. So this is the question. The participants will be able to either use any of these things to describe themselves. They can decide to use these sticky notes, which is the very common one. Uh, say, for example, my name is Simon. Okay. Then they click save. So this is one of the elements that they use, uh, the sticky notes. So they can use any of these. They can use a photo, for example, if they wanted to add an image from either Google, right? Um, I don't know. Yeah, uh, what, what can I search? What do I search? I search for Makerere, right? Uh, hoping I'm going to get, right? They can put images from their own computer, or from the internet, right? There are so many other things they can do. So depending on the nature of the assignment you're given, they can be able to do this. So the, the reason we do a Jamboard is so that they have synchronous collaboration. 
meaning they are doing something together at the same time. For example, you want them to brainstorm ideas. You can use a Jamboard to do that. Now, uh, how do you share this with your students? So the first thing that we do, first of all, sorry, someone else asked something? If, please, if I want to draw a triangle, how do I do that? A triangle that I'm going to label. These are, these, these are shapes. You see this, okay. this, this circle here? Yes. These are shapes, right? So these are shapes. You go to the shapes and you draw your triangle here, like that. Like that, that's and how you draw a triangle. How do I label it? Label it? You label it with Yes, like uh, maybe root three, root six. I mean, using some square root uh, symbols. Or um, now that one, I would advise you it, to do it somewhere else because um, it, it's, not, uh, it's not part of the Jamboard. A Jamboard is a collaboration tool. It's not, it's not, um, it's not a tool to write expressions but there are free tools that can be used to write expressions. I think that one I can leave it for next, um, remind me next in the next live session, ask that question during Q&A and myself and Jared will be able to show you some of the tools that you can use to write those types of expressions. Then once you've written those expressions and those tools, okay, mathematical expressions, you can save them on your computer. Now, what you will do since you have saved them as an image, you will now just upload the image on the Jamboard. You'll have written it elsewhere, saved on your computer. Now you bring it to the Jamboard. Is that clear? Yes, please. Thank you. Yes. So if you don't know the tools, um, that one we can cover next. Mathematical expression tools that you can use to um, to 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 to, to, do, um, to develop content. So roots and all that. Those things that you write in mathematics and engineering, you can do that. Save them as images and then bring on the Jamboard as you ask the question. Then everyone else can collaborate. Okay. Now, please, how do we share this? Like the way it was shared with us, we are able to do our own writing. How did you get the link? Perfect. Of that is the next jumbo. thing. Okay. That's the next thing. So the first thing we need to do is to, of course, to write the name of a jam. It's not a must, you can write, but just to differentiate from the rest of your jam boards. Um, I can call this one introductions. Well, it's just a name which you'll, you'll call your jam board so that you differentiate from the rest, all right? This is how you share. To share your Jamboard with your students, you click on share, this blue button here. See right now it's private, only to me. It's only me who can do anything to it. To be able to share, I click on it. Then uh, uh, here is if you have Google addresses of your students, of course, that's not possible. You want to make it as simple as possible. The second option is get link, this one. Yeah. Now the trick with this is this. Um, by default, by default, if you click that, the people only can only view. They'll only be able to see, but they'll not be able to type. So these are very important steps. So let me go back. Um, so it's important that you, um, you, you change this, this setting here. Anyone with a link, this one, see this one? Anyone with a link? You change here, viewer. You see here, viewer? Change it yeah. to editor. So that what this means is, instead of them just be, being able to see, they will be able to actually collaborate, type, and upload images. That is why it's very important. These are very important steps that I've seen some colleagues, you know, mess up with. If they don't make it an editor, your students will not be able to do anything. So that is a very important step that you must not forget. Make... Make everyone with a link an editor. Once you've done that, that's it. So remember what I said, I said share. Then I went here, anyone with the link, then I clicked there was a link here to be able to change here. And then I changed from viewer to editor. And then I said, done. Now, once you've done that, you go back to the same process, share. Then you click on copy link, this one. That's it. Now, if I go to the chat here, I can now type, uh, put, maybe we're in Zoom, I can put that Zoom link for all my students to be able to reach. So if you go to that link, if you click on that link, you'll get my Jamboard and you'll be able to type, you'll be able to do activities on it. Say done. Has anybody tried? Have you seen it? Have you seen the my Jamboard? 
Could you try to do something on it? Try to play around these tools. You can never break a computer. Okay. <laughs> please, can I ask a question? Yes, you can, please. Yeah, so as we saw the post by several um, students, but how do you determine the identity of the various posts? It's difficult to do that. Um, oh, okay. It's difficult to do that unless you, you ask them to include the name in the post. Uh, it's difficult to do that. Uh, the only because because remember you you said anyone with a link so anyone with a link will be able to do whatever they whatever it is. Um, the only way to to identify who did what is if you had all the email addresses and then instead of saying anyone with a link you put the addresses here, then it will be possible to share them to know them. But otherwise, normally for Jamboard, the the reason is for them to create something together and just you know brainstorm ideas without. Um, knowing who it's who if you want that then you have to ask them to um to, to write their name as as part of the post hi someone what if you want you don't want them to have the link anymore what if you don't want them to, to, to maybe post at the anymore? end of the day you just don't you just don't want them to have the link anymore yes what you do you go back and restrict you go to the same place you said share and then you come here and say change and now you say anyone with the link becomes a viewer. So they'll only see, they'll not be able to type. So they'll not be able to, you know, to contribute any longer. Simon? Yes. What if you don't want yes. them to be a viewer? You don't want them to even access it anymore? Be after you had already shared? Yes. Uh, is it possible to do that? To restrict? Yes, you can, I think. Uh, what you do? Maybe you'll have to. You, do, um... you see here? Anyone with a link, you come and say restricted. Then they'll not be able to even follow that link. Yeah. Anyone with a link, then you just come and say restricted. If I do it right now, you'll not be able to see it. Restricted, here. Yeah. I'd always been wondering about how to do that. Thank you. <laughs> you just come here and say restricted. Oh, okay. Then even Thank if you have the link, even if you have the link, it's useless. I've been thinking about classes I've finished and I don't want them to have the link anymore. <laughs> yes. You just restricted. <laughs> Hello, Simon. Uh, yes, the work also like uh, Padlet. Yes, somehow yes. The, the I yeah, cannot but, seem to play with a Jamboard. Sorry. I can't play with a Jamboard. Is that is there any reason why I cannot play with it? I can't do anything from my end. This my Jamboard. No, did you yes. open it in Google? Because I've, oh, I've okay. learned, click on the so link. You're not going to be able to put it on here, but you have to go separately onto Google. So click on the, the link okay. that um, uh, I'm provided. Yes, so I will put okay. the link in the chat. Did you see? Yeah, and the tiles. The, they, the, the sticky notes are like tiles. So they, they jump on one another. So you just have to move them. Um, so my Natasha was here, is here, was kind of embedded underneath. So can you see there? So you just need to make sure that you just move from, from that part. And then it's very important what Simon said in terms of having the um, viewer um, change to editor, because when, when I did the Jamboard, I made that mistake. And then people said, no, but they can't access it. So I had to go and look again to see why. And then I realized, oh, because I didn't do that very important step. I did everything, but not this step. And that is how we literally learn every day something new. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha, for that. That step, if you forget, it will be difficult for you. And then these are the tools that you use. These, uh, these are sticky notes. The sticky notes, you can also choose a color. Oh, yeah. I see people have already chosen colors. You can always choose the color that you want to, to use on the sticky note. Yeah. Uh, oh, yes. I was asking the question about Padlet. Uh, yes. Pa the concept between Padlet and um, how do I get Jamboard? I missed this, please. I'll, I'll just repeat. Uh, but let me answer this question about Padlet. Padlet um, and Jamboard, the concept is the same. They are the same class of tools. They are co online collaboration. They, um, they are synchronous collaboration tools. 
uh, online collaboration tool. So the, the, the principle is the same. Uh, it's just the layout and the companies are different. And so maybe I can say perhaps, um, perhaps what do you call it? Uh, Padlet has more features than Jamboard, um, but the, the concept is the same. Right now I'm just doing a, a course for um, teachers in Africa, which is starting next Monday. And I use Padlet a lot. I'll just show you an example of a Padlet for those who are not familiar with, um, with it. Um, it's my course on Open EDX. Um, open EDX, yes, this one. So this is an example of a Padlet, uh, should be down here. This one here. Right, I just uh, did, a, 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 I show uh, um, an example here, so I can just delete, uh, right, there it is. Oh, this is in French. I opened you the French course anyway, but it's just the same, same concept anyway. So you just upload here, you click on upload. You can upload photos, you can upload other content, you can type and things like that, right? So that's what you call a jump board. Hi, what do you call it? This is called a Padlet, sorry. This is called a Padlet, it's a Padlet. Sorry, I showed you the, oh, no, no, no. I, I, just, I just need to change my language back to English. I think I changed it to French sometime. Yeah, this Padlet, you see the concept is the same. It's just a matter of typing. It's called Padlet, Padlet. Maybe I type it here. Yes, I Padlet. Padlet, Padlet. Okay, okay. But the concept is the same. You see the, the concept um, is the same. Okay. Um, I just have one question. I've got one question. Yeah. How do you prevent participants from annotating your Jamboard? Because some people fail to pick a sticky note and then pick the pen and write there. <laughs> Surprisingly, sorry to let you know that there is no way. <laughs> because <laughs> the essence of the Jamboard is to let them put the ideas out. No. Remember, however... Yeah in whichever form, whether they want to draw, whether they want to write. So there's no way, unless you just delete them. The only thing you can do is maybe if you don't like something, you just click on it and delete. That sounds good. Yeah, that's the only way. But the, the essence of the Jamboard is to is for them to put the ideas out. Now, I'll repeat for those who are not here before. Um, so I said to go to the Jamboard, you go to your Gmail address. You have to have a Google address from your Gmail, for example. Then you click on these uh, nine dots here. They're called the Google Apps. Then you scroll down, look for Jamboard. It is down here, yeah. Jamboard, you click on it. It will show you all the Jamboards that you have. Like the ones we are looking at right now is here. These other ones are the one I've, I've been working with through my, um, through my, 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 the presentation I've been having this year. Uh, this is one about living heritage. This is UNESCO's debrief. There is, um, what was this? This was a French, um, yeah, something on education, right? This is pedal, right? So you just click on this one, this, this, this plus, this addition sign. That's how you get your jump board. Yeah. Sorry, Simon, let me ask you this question. There's an assumption that your students know how to use Jamboard if you're doing this. Like, I mean, do you understand what I'm trying to say? If you want them to contribute, that means you're assuming that they know how to use Jamboard. Yes. Um, of course, you have to give them a short introduction, for example. The main problem yeah. normally is how to create it. So it's the, the, S, the, the, the burden is more on you than the students. Okay. Because once you know how to create it, yes. um, and they know basically where the sticky note is, it's, it is not difficult for them because it's just a matter of going to pick a sticky note and typing their thoughts. So it's not as so difficult. It may so, take you two, three, four minutes to. So if I, if I have like about 10 slides, I'd like I have 10 groups of students now on mm -hmm. different sixes, like six or seven, um, like 10 assignments. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what am I saying? Like six groups with six assignments. I can actually create like the six um, slides or what is it pages now? Or what do you call them? They're called, I'll call them slides. Well, I don't know what okay, people call them. So I can actually um, dedicate one slide friends. to each person, uh, to each group, and tell them to populate it with their okay. ideas exactly. as a way That's of best. making them create. Uh, uh, yes. What you do, you create the Jamboard yourself. So if, for example, if it's one assignment 
and it is they're divided into groups, the best way to do it is to have one jam board, but then each group has a slide. So this group one, for example, this slide one, you can even type the name there. Let's say you call this group one, and maybe even they're doing different, maybe it's the same question, but different uh, facet of the same question. So this will be group one, uh, group one, um, uh, let's say maybe gender and cost design, right? Then you go to group two and say, this is group two, uh, group two, and then say maybe gender in, um, in, 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 in facilitation, okay? And then say, uh, this is group three, this is group three, say maybe gender in assessment, right? Maybe group four, and say maybe group four, will be about um, gender in selection selection of, of uh, learning material. Okay. So you see it's one jam board, but then each group has their own slide. So it's a matter of them knowing which slide they are in so that they contribute. So you'll have on this slide, group one, who are just concentrated on, course, uh, on gender and course design then they can move like that. You say this is yeah, good one. I think this is, a, this is an excellent idea. Yeah. So then they can now just, I mean, uh, this is good. Thank you. Exactly. Um, this, this is an aha moment for me. This is also an aha moment for me too. Thank you. <laughs> it came for me to hear. Yeah. So during, during the time of sharing, will all of them come on all the, the, the jams will be up here? Or? You oh, share the you link with them. You share the link with them and you tell them to work in groups and they, they just paste their ideas on the group. This is a way of harnessing, making them yes, look and harnessing their ideas. So at the end, when we are now looking at the general thing, we'll have all the six, all the four on the same, on the same jumbo. You yeah. scroll from one page to the other. Discussing group one, you show group one. So discussing group two, you go to uh, page two. Exactly. Okay. I just love this. Mm. I wish I'd done this with, with my undergraduate class I just finished now. It's no. great. It's great. They had discussion <laughs> points and all that. And, you know, mm. instead of presenting individually, they could just have, you know, put their ideas on those jam. Uh, and now group two knows what we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Simon. Yes, yes. yes. I, I listened to you and I listened to Penina. Yeah. Oh, okay. I just one final question. How accessible is Jamboard? to students who are contributing collaboratively but do not have Gmail accounts. They may be having institutional accounts or Yahoo or Microsoft accounts. Oh yeah, let me just make it clear. It is the creator who needs to have a Gmail account. The other people don't, it doesn't matter whether, then they don't need to be signed into Gmail. The other people can not, it's not a must they're in Gmail at all. It's only difficult if you have students from China <laughs> because, <laughs> Because Ch Google is not accessible in China. So unless they're using VPN, that becomes a bit difficult because Google products are not, uh, are not available in China. That becomes a bit difficult. But the rest of the countries, no, you, you are good. It does, they don't even need to have a Gmail account. But I'm not Great. in China, Great. but I don't seem to have Google Sites. Uh, you don't have Google Sites. Or yeah, Google. I don't have access to Google right. Sites. Well, you, you were supposed to download the Chrome right. actually before the class started. <laughs> no, no, no. That no, That's actually something else. You don't have Sites? Do you want to share your screen? Or oh, maybe she doesn't have a Google address, email address. Do you have a Gmail address? Uh, yes, I do Google. have a Gmail address. I do have a Gmail address. And I did go into the workspace. And I was told, I'm sorry, but you do not have access to Google Sites. Wow. Aha, uh -huh. that is that may be interesting. Your wow. Gmail is linked to institution, no? Or is uh, yes, I, I use both. I have a private one and I have the one linked to the institution, and they both gave me the same. Try, wow. try, try the, your personal. Do you want to share your personal one? I mean, I mean, do you want to share your screen and just go to sites.google.com? That would be strange if you are not accessible, unless you're in China and you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have an alternative. Can I use Wix? <laughs> Meets. Meets is still a Google product. They cannot give you no, sites and they don't give you Meets because all of them I'm, are Google I'm, products. I'm saying Wix, Wix, Wix to create oh, Wix. the portfolio. Oh, Wix. Oh, Wix. Um, yeah, of course. Why not? 
Uh, but but uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, of course you can, you can. But I'm just wondering that I, I really would. I'm really interested in uh, why it's telling you it's not accessible. I would rather. I mean, I would rather you share your screen now because I mean, I may, I may have like uh, ten minutes um, to just see what your problem is. Maybe check, then you share your screen when you're ready. Hmm. So it's twelve times Stella. <laughs> That's why I can say this to her. Hello. <laughs> Okay, yes, let me try to share my screen. Please do, okay. please do. Someone is why, speaking. Why, please speak. Yes, why she's trying to do that? Please, if I have to write instead of typing, like I want to write maybe 376 plus 478, just numbers like that, not with symbols. I mean, just do some calculations. Yeah, yeah. If you're just typing numbers in, on Jumbo. Yeah. Yes, you can do that just using the text tool. Text. The text so I tool. Still have Okay, I still have to type. I cannot write ordinarily without typing. No, no, no. You have, you have to. Mm, I mean, if you're creative enough, there is a pen tool. If you're careful with the, with the tools, there is a pen tool. If you're creative enough, you can do that, I think. Yeah, I noticed I was trying to do it sometimes ago, and uh, it was zigzag. It wasn't smooth. It wasn't what we look like, I don't know, G or something like that. I thought there could be a way out of it. So that as soon as I finish writing, then it will transform itself. Oh, okay. So, okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't think that is pos possible with Jumbo that now, but I know there are tools within, even within Google that allow you to do that, um, that you, you, you write and then they transport to, to type text. Yeah, I think, I think there are tools, but not necessarily with Jumbo. Oh, okay. So yeah, then you help me with that one later because I need to learn that. No worries. There, there are tools. There are tools, definitely. Okay. Tech, okay. They're called um, handwriting to text. Okay. Yeah. So um, Stella, maybe let's start with you. Go to the the, the, the nine dots, the one uh, just next to your-, your the, I don't know, am dot. I sharing my screen now? Yes, you are, you are. Okay, so I go to the dots. There yes, we go. Yes, then scroll down. Scroll down, scroll down, scroll up, 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 uh, up again, uh, up again. That's All it. Right. What you do um, up, up there, type sites.google.com in your. In We're your, here and the search. Yep, no, no, not the search, the up one, the, 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 the web bar. The web bar. The, the, no, up, 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 up. Yes, there. There. Yeah. Sites.google.com. You can see my Jamboard. Yes, I can see the Jamboard. It's called PAD122. Yeah, I have the Jamboard, but I do not have the. What do sites, they call yes. The sites. You see what I get? No, uh, okay, okay, you do not have access, please contact your organization. Okay, okay, your organization uh, administrator does not allow you, so you will need to go sign in your in your private Gmail, sign off from the institution, right? Yes, okay. Even if possible, use another browser, because what's happening is your institution um, does not allow you to go to Google Sites. They have what you call the Google Suits, and they don't have Google Sites as part of the Google Suits. So what you need to do, but then with your regular email, you have Google Sites. <laughs> so what you need to, do is to sign no, out it's... completely from your institution's email. Make sure it is only your email that is on that browser. Someone, it's funny, but I went through my personal email as well, and I got the same message. Yes, the reason is when you go there, it still it still tries to link you up to the institution one. Ah, so it, <laughs> that's what's happening. That's what I'm saying. If possible, this is this is what this Chrome. Uh, is this Chrome? Is this Chrome or something else? If possible, even no, open. It's so completely out. Yes, or you can. I don't know if you know how to use incognito mode or a private private window. You can open a private window, log into your Gmail. You, if you go to Google Sites, it will it will accept because it's, okay, just, uh, <laughs> it's just conflicting with your institutions. Yes, I will try it. Alternatively, what I did to keep up the pace, I just uh, designed the portfolio on Wix because I can share a link on Wix as well. And um, the groups and all the pages, everything is the no, same. That's fine. That's, that's okay. absolutely okay. Yeah, that's absolutely okay. Yeah, it looks like I'm in China, hey? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not in China. It's just that um, your institution got the, uh, what do you call the, the, the Google Suites and they, the, the, the yeah. suite does not have sites as part of it. That's why. And so I start everything federal related through my personal Gmail account, because remember, although you be the back is it is Google. Yeah, it also. So when I look at students portfolios, 
which we're doing on, on, on Google sites, I can't access it. I have to go to my personal email. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Natasha. I will try good journey, so I will contact.